She is someone who can change the destiny of the tower. If you stand before her again, what choice will you make? These are words spoken at the end of the workshop battle arc in chapters 110. So hello everyone and welcome to the enemy's Ilia and thank you for joining me as we go over part 2 of the Revolution Road arc within the Tower of God webtoon series. And if you've not watched part 1, then make sure you go and give that video a look. However, this video will be going over the contents and my thoughts of the contents within chapter 131 to chapter 152. So we're going to finish off this arc, and honestly, this arc was fantastic from start to finish. But where to begin? Well, I've just quoted lines from chapter 110, so why not answer that question? As Bam and Rachel finally reunited in this arc, and I thought the way they handled this was done magnificently. I love the series telling us that Rachel knew all along about how Bam felt about her and still did the actions that she has currently taken. As this gives us more reason to dislike her character and adds more impact to the actions she has currently done. Changing her character from a scumbag that betrays the people around her to a scumbag that still treats people around her but also is someone who is happy to tread and play with other people's emotions and feelings, dreams, making her more sick and more twisted of a character, adding more depth and more layers, and I really did like this. Throughout this entire encounter, her expressions on her face and her tone that she used within her dialogue only changed when she knew she could get a reaction out of Bam to help benefit herself and her team. An example of this would be when she spread out her arms as if to kind of catch him or cradle him or to stop him and said, kill me to stop me. She knew exactly that Bam would never be able to do that. But to add more insult to injury, she adds a change to her tone in her dialogue and body language before actually changing back to a cold hearted stare that she always locks on to Bam and Kuhn throughout this entire chapter or arc I should say. She also pushes Bam off again another ledge and gives him a look of superiority. This is something that reoccurs later in the arc but Rachel always needs to feel superior to Bam and honestly I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail in just a minute but yeah I really like this kind of display of emotion and um, feeling kind of body language from Rachel's character. Saying that however her composure while her exchange with Kuhn was a little bit shaky. She kept switching back and forth between cold hearted and hesitant. She knows just how powerful and how cunning Kuhn actually is and the fact that she doesn't have as much control over him as she does over a character like Bam, played a factor in the way that she handled the situation. She started off acting very cold and sinister and like, oh, let me guess, you want to ask me all these questions that have running through your mind. And then she tries to attack him and stop him, and once she finds out that's not an option, she changes her tone slightly, again, switching back and forth between her different kind of composures that she displays here. So then, what did Bam do once he finally met Rachel again? Well, he at first wasn't sure as to what to say. His mind was very conflicted. As to whether or not to question Rachel, asking her why she betrayed him, or pretend that nothing happened at all between the two, and kind of sweep it under the rug. As he still was holding on to hope, praying that she was still his angel that he always thought she was. So that when Rachel rejected him, Bam freaked out. At first, it did strike me a little bit as possessive, especially when you factor in the angry shout of unacceptable. The raw rage and emotion that came with that panel was phenomenal. However, that is not the case, because I've thought it over a little bit more, and every moment that has been shown to us, everything that Bam believes, we know came from Rachel. So at this very point, his mind is currently very conflicted, very confused, and is falling apart piece by piece because everything that he was taught, everything that he knows, is suddenly falling apart. 
Although throughout the tower, throughout climbing and finding Rachel to the first point, Bam's views of the world has slightly changed thanks to his friends he's made along the way. However, his core beliefs, his truths, he's all gained from Rachel, the one person that he feels he cannot live without. Since after the first push of season one, we've been seeing Bam trying to climb back up the tower, asking himself, trying to find the answer as to why the ray of light within his life slash his angel, why does she betray him slash leave him? So yes, of course, Bam is just scared. He's not crazy at all, he's not a stalker, and he's not possessive. He's just confused. His ideals and his knowledge about the world is currently changing and falling apart and reforming as the moments are happening. Plus, you have to factor in that Bam's actions throughout his entire time and process would be affected by his mental fatigue. After all, he's been using the thorn to fight, um, and he's not really had a lot of time to rest between the uh, tournament and the, the tournament at the start, as well as the fight with Daniel, and obviously using the thorn itself. Plus, Bam isn't fully developed yet. His mind still needs a lot more maturing, and he's easily convinced or manipulated at the best of times. So when you factor this into, Bam just needs to develop more, and it just shows just how mentally and how physically Bam is actually currently at. I know that might sound a little bit rambly, but I really did enjoy the dynamic of both uh, Rachel and Bam from these chapters. They were very well conveyed, and remember, that memory within the cave that we get within this arc was fantastic in kind of opening up a few different factors and proving that Rachel needs to feel more superior to Bam's character. As this again goes back to the idea of Rachel being important to Bam, as she refuses to agree with Bam about them going to see that mountain. Bam's like, well, it's not really a mountain. And she's like, yes, it is. She's all excited and kind of refutes what Bam is saying. As well as the fact is, she tells Bam that only chosen people can live up in the world of light. And the fact that she comes down from that and visits him makes her important in his mind, making it easy uh, for her to feed whatever she wishes into Bam's mind and brain so that he will believe anything that she tells him. Oh well, that's enough about Rachel and Bam. However, if you want to continue talking about Bam, let's talk about Bam and the Thorn, as this gets a very interesting kind of um, dynamic between the two, item and character, because Bam is talking to his inner self at the end of this arc, and I think the two are very highly possible connected. Red Turtle tells Bam um, that you can only use the Thorn for 10 minutes, per day, as his body can't handle any more than that. And clearly, he went beyond that time limit and the usage that he can use. Another problem that occurs when using the Thorn's power for a long period of time is that it could try to possess or destroy your own body. And this is what I'm thinking is currently happening. That big red orb that's inside of Bam and he's talking to is like a manifestation of that needle. Weapons having a voice or a spiritual Manifestation is something that has appeared within the story before. Black March is an example. So saying that the manifestation of um, Eneru awakening inside of Bam isn't too far or too big of a stretch. Only time will tell if this is actually the fact. But remember, we see Bam's hand at the end of this arc and it does not look like the hand that we currently know of Bam's character. He's very angry and enraged with a fist that's clenched. You see the veins popping in the hand and honestly it feels like it's a different personality almost. So Bam accepting that power from that red orb could be a small way of him being slowly but surely possessed or influenced. Again he's in a very weakened and dark state at the moment both mentally and physically. So, it's possible. Plus, learning of his time skip, what happened to Bam in the time skip was very interesting. 
The fact that he went and trained and learned martial arts techniques and skills throughout the entire tower and allowing him to kind of combine and fuse different techniques together to give him a wider range of skills to use in battle, I thought was awesome. Seeing that as well was fantastic in the fight against Daniel. And speaking of time skip, Team Sweet and Sour arrive, showing off their improved skills. Seeing the changes the characters have undergone uh, throughout the time skip, I really did enjoy. I liked the upgrade that Miss Singh showed off, and Eon looks to have some proper flames. The look, fire. Bad joke, I know. Wang Nang is acting a lot more mature, and his fight against Casio, um, as well as the knowledge about the bombs, I really, really thought was a great touch and addition to the chapter. These Shinzu bombs were specially designed purely to combat someone like Casio or anyone like him in order to help bring them down if they went out of control. And this is a great piece of information simply because it shows off the dedication and the commitment and the drive of both Sophia, the scientist that helped create both devils that we know of, and Team Sweet and Sour, as saving their friend is their top priority. And Wang Nang, using these Shinzu type bombs, eats away at his lifespan while using them. So I thought this was a very powerful segment of this arc that did kind of go a little bit under the radar, but I thought again, it was fantastic seeing them back, seeing how they've improved, and honestly, I can't wait to see more. We don't see glasses in this, but I'm pretty sure she's with uh, Hiyoyang, uh, looking after him, so I'm not surprised there. Prince still needs to show off a bit more though, because yeah, he got a couple of attacks in, but I'm still not buying him as a character. The conversation between Kuhn and Rack showed a lot of anger and disappointment thrown towards Kuhn's character from Rack, prospectively. As it's clear that Rack wanted to take part in the action when going after Rachel's team or just the tournament in general, and yet he showed reserved and trust in his teammates and everyone else that was involved, so his reactions were completely justified. Learning that Kuhn had failed the task at hand was, um, you know, it was understandable as to why Rack went out of control and went angry and started shouting and kind of blaming Kuhn for that, because he trusts Kuhn. He knows what he's capable of, and to kind of learn that he failed because, you know, he, well, not failed because he wasn't there, but the fact that they failed and he wasn't there makes him feel like he's powerless and he made the wrong decision. So again, I like the way that Rack handled it, and I thought it was well justified and played off. Fug wants to revive a former Slayer nominee in the name of Ho Chin. Now, I know nothing about this character except the name given in this arc and the silhouette that we see. But just looking at that image that we get shown, he looks insanely strong and incredible. I love the kind of eye visuals of like the flames coming out. I think that looks awesome. The rest of Team Rachel were surprisingly pretty cool. Considering they got quite a lot of focus and spotlight, I thought their characters did shine quite nicely and give us something to enjoy from each one of them. The angel, the girl with the halo, was pretty cool with her dialogue and personality and the metal fish were really unique. Both personality and skill set. While the drill wielding character uh, offered a bit of teasing in mentioning that he also has confronted the mag dog that we saw in the workshop battle arc, telling us as the audience that he too must be really strong and formidable, being able to still be alive after an encounter from that insanely strong character. The old man Daniel had the spotlight for most of this arc, and gave us a lot of confirmation in different types of things. We learned that he's the comrade of the other big name characters within the series at the current time as he too was on a train a very long time ago with the likes of Mr. Boro, the swordsman that's on Bam's team, who, by the way, has phenomenal uh, sword skills, and I'd love to see him and Hats go one-on-one -on -one together. I think that would be an amazing uh, spectacle fight to see. And, of course, 
He also went on the train with the character A.K.A. Williams, who had a pretty, who had a pretty fun dynamic between uh, himself, herself, I'm not quite sure, and uh, Dan, Ran, Ran, the the Coon member family. Plus the name of uh, Rowan, Rowan, I think that's how you say it, kept appearing. As a character who is currently dead or deceased, and is Daniel's sole purpose of going back to hell. That's why he wants to get on the train, he wants to bring her back. I thought the commissioner guy, the train guy, or whatever you want to call him, I thought he was really annoying, and I didn't like his character at all. Um, but yeah, he was always whining, going, You said you promised that nothing bad would happen. I, I didn't like him. Can we, like, get rid of him soon, please? Thanks. So, something just sprung up in my mind and reminded me that there was a battle with Bam's teammate and this kind of chosen knight from his village that was with Yuha, or Yuha. And the line here that reads, is there really a place on the train where you can turn back time? Really stuck out to me and piqued my interest a little bit. A place called where you can go back. Now, my first initial thoughts was, is Rachel's team working with Fug to help them bring back that person that Daniel wants to bring back? Is that how it's going to work? Like, Fug is going to supply them with resources and help in order to achieve their goals of bringing back that, um, that Slayer nominee that they were going to try and revive. As well as the fact is, in turn, this would help Daniel bring back his friend that passed away. That's the only connection I can really think of that I can make. I don't really know how like solid that is because I've got no evidence for it. But I thought this character left a very interesting mystery that adds to the characters that are involved on the Hell Train at this moment in time before he passed away, I guess. But yeah, I mean, it must have been big because whatever uh, Yuha told this guy, this guy wanted to fight to the death for her. So, I definitely thought it was worth adding it in. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments. Back to the normal video. Overall, this second part of the arc was incredible. A lot of amazing fights, brilliant artwork, top quality character interactions. Some that have also led to unexpected character development from characters that we would not kind of expect to see in the future. Like the Red Turtle, aka the guide that's with Bam's team, as she's not been on top form throughout this arc, getting defeated by the metal fish and also by the phone app, Amelia. Even that phone app has made it hard for her to read the way and the path that she should take. But fear not, she'll most likely get her redemption and get rescued by Wang Nang and Eon, as both are on the Hell Train thanks to Kuhn's clever thinking at the end and usage of the, is it White Mirror Knife? The knife that basically if you stab someone in the heart, they can store them within the knife. I thought that was awesome. I like that touch at the end. Yeah, really excited to see what happens and what the future holds for the series. And uh, how the team get onto the train now that they have to get on at the next stop, stopping the train. But who was it that Kuhn contact? did at the end of this arc because it can't be Shibisu because it said it's been a long time since they've met. My guess is going to be the inflatable bloom guy that we see um, just before the team take the test on the test floor in season one. You know what I mean, the inflatable airbag, I think it's going to be him. He's going to jump in front of the train, stop it with his big inflatableness and then that's how they're going to stall the hell train. I don't know why I don't know why I said that, but let's move on. If I missed anything throughout this arc, then please let me know in the comment section down below. And like always, if there's any sort of a lot of things that I've missed out, then of course I'll try and make a follow-up video, uh, like I have done with a few others. Go check out part one if you haven't already. Um, but again, let me know your thoughts on this arc in the comment section down below. What did you think? I want to find out, and let's have a conversation about it. Sorry if I mispronounced any names wrong, but uh, it takes me a while to learn them. Anyway though, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like it if you did, and subscribe if you're new, 
so you never miss a video from me as we keep going up the tower. Have fun, stay safe, have a great day. Arigato, matane! Goodbye!